Um, I looked and uh, welcome to all of you who are out there to our, um, our the last of our Saints Alive webinars for the extended 20, I guess it started in 2019, the 2019 to 2021 series that went right through last summer. It's so good to have you with us again in this um, format that allows us to invite so many interesting people to be here with us. Um, so thank you for all the all of you who have tuned in and and um, just contributed your thoughts and your reactions to what we've been doing. Uh, that is, I'm just going to stay on that that uh, theme for a second. We are going to be taking July, August, and September off and getting together our program for the 2021 to 2022 year, which will begin on the first Thursday of October. So just so you all know, that's the plan. Today, we are delighted to have John Taplin with us. John is a member of the parish uh, who, has, uh, who has added to the pantheon of the voices of God that speak from <laughs> the pulpit when reading scriptures. And we're so glad to have his contributions that way. Um, but much more importantly for today to have him talk to us about a book that he's written that chronicles his experience and journey through a world and a time, worlds and times that are of such interest to so many of us. So I'm not gonna get too much farther into that, but the book is great and it's just come out. And so he and Bruce are gonna talk about that. Um, also just one last thing before uh, we say a prayer of thanksgiving for this moment. Um, there will be at the end of our seminar or maybe during Stephanie might be good. Stephanie is running tech today. Uh, she will put the link in the chat box for uh, purchase for John, of John's book with a 20% discount. But while I'm on the subject of the logistics, there will be a point in today's program where we will be doing, uh, taking questions from all of you. And so I want to underline right now that the place you put those is in the Q and A box, not the chat. So when the time comes when we open up for questions, please put them in the Q&A box that you should be able to access along the bar at the bottom of your screen. And I think that's all that I'm supposed to say, except the Lord be with you. And also with, also you. with you. Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, for the many opportunities that have risen out of this very strange year. Um, one of which is that we are able to gather for programs like this one. We thank you today for the story that John has to tell and the ways in which uh, we will, as listeners, realize that we have intersections with that story and the way that the conversation around that story enriches all of us. We thank you for being present here, we ask you to bless us and inform and inspire our thinking and our, and our searching and our wondering in response to what we hear and say today. So be with us and bless us and uh, we thank you for this wonderful community in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so now at this point, I'm going to uh, just turn this over to our I, well, I, actually, I should probably say John is the person with the facial hair, and I'm sure you all know that. And the other person wearing the white collar is our rector, Bruce Freeman. So great to have you both. And I'm going to disappear and say, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, I am really pleased uh, to be uh, the interviewer um, of my friend John Taplin. Um, this is the first time that I've done this on the webinar uh, technology for Saints of Life, or for any technology that is, or any other format that is. So um, I'm moving into this with uh, fear and trepidation, but also a great amount of love for um, my friend John and for the material in this book and the material that he um, has given us and the thought processes and the ideas that he's given us in all of his books. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary stuff. So as we begin, um, what I would like to do is to ask uh, John uh, to context this whole thing, to do a quick reading from the first two pages of his prologue uh, to this book, The Magic Years, Scenes from a Rock and Roll Life, and, um, and we can go from there. Thanks, Bruce. 
Strapped to a Fender Stratocaster electric guitar, Bob Dylan launched into the opening chords of Maggie's Farm almost before the band was ready. The Newport Folk Festival of 1965 was going to close with a commotion. I had just turned 18 and was an apprentice road manager for Dylan's manager. This explosive moment launched me on a lifelong journey, one beyond anything I could have imagined at the time. I was standing in the stage wing, transfixed, 10 feet from the band. Mike Bloomfield, acting like band leader, brought his Butterfield Blues Band Rhythm Section, drummer Sam Lay and bassist Jerome Arnold into some approximation of sync with Dylan's rhythm. Al Cooper in a loud polka dot shirt hunched over the Hammond organ and did his best to fill in the spaces, but it wasn't starting well. I ran out towards the mixing booth in front of the stage where Peter Yarrow had commandeered the board. It was worse out front. In his nervousness, Bloomfield kept raising his guitar volume, and was now drowning out everything else. The first tune ended on a sour note and there was only light applause in the audience. I gazed behind me and the look of shock seemed to be the dominant emotion in the sea of blue work shirts and peasant blouses. The man in the tight pants, orange shirt and black leather jacket was not their Bob Dylan. What was going on? A chorus of boos filled the air before Bob started his radio hit like a Rolling Stone. But by the end, the fans were still booing. Voices from the crowd called for their favorite tunes from the folk era. The band looked nervous, but without a word to the audience, Bob plunged into it takes a lot to laugh. It takes a train to cry. The band found their groove, but when the tune ended, the booing got worse. Dylan turned to Bloomfield and said, let's split. To the surprise of the other musicians and the road crew, he unplugged his fender and walked off the stage. Instantly, the crowd went silent. People started yelling at each other in the aisles. Look what you did. He's gone, asshole. Peter Yarrow bolted from the mixing console and I followed him backstage. Dylan was sitting on the bottom steps of the stairway leading up to the stage. He was clearly shaken, rubbing his eyes. Peter ran up onto the stage and seized the microphone. Hey, show Bobby that you love him. Let's get him back. The audience roared approval. Dylan sat still on the steps. The audience began to clap in rhythm. Dylan refused to budge. Peter Yarrow appeared at the top of the stairs, pleading with him to return. Johnny Cash walked out of the artist's tent, holding an acoustic guitar. For a moment, he watched the triangular drama of Peter, Bob, and the crowd. He moved over to Bob and handed him the guitar. Play them a song, son. Bob took the guitar and slowly walked up the 30 steps of the stage. When he appeared in a lone spiral eye holding the acoustic guitar, the cheers from the audience were deafening. He leaned towards the microphone, raised his harmonica holder. Does anyone have a D harmonica? Out of the crowd, three of Honer's finest sailed through the air into the stage. Dylan danced out of the way and grinning, picked up one and placed it in the holder. He started to strum the guitar and he played, it's all over now, baby blue. When he finished the song, he rushed through Mr. Tambourine Man and then without a word, quickly walked off the stage. He had said his piece, they did not own him and like a lover leaving a bad relationship breakup, he would not turn back. <laughs> well, before we go into the meaning of that moment, John, um, you uh, say, as you talked about your career, which started uh, before that space, uh, but at a very young age and has not ended yet, um, that you, when you, your only advice is that when you see a great opportunity, it presents itself, don't be afraid to take it. Um, you know, I, what that brings up in my brain is uh, Yogi Berra, who said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> How did you get to be at that fork in the road? So I went to a prep school in 
North Andover, Massachusetts called Brooks. And it was kind of a sullen, not a fun experience for me. I was the late arrival in my class and was from the Midwest and most of the kids were from the East and I didn't really understand the social mores and I was kind of a lost soul. But in my junior year, I discovered this place in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Club 47, which was the, the folk club of that era. And through that club came Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, uh, Sun House, the Charles River Valley Boys, Eric Bunchman, all the panoply of great folk music that was so, and I began to be in love with this music and especially Dylan's music. And so when I graduated in 1965 uh, from prep school, I decided I was gonna go to the Newport Folk Festival come higher, hell or high water. And I did, and my brother, my older brother knew a guy named Paul Clayton who was a friend of Bob Dylan's. And he was there at the festival and he managed to get me a backstage pass. <laughs> and then he introduced me to a band called the Jim Queskin Jug Band, which I had seen play at the Club mm -hmm. 47. And they needed a road manager. And I said, well, I'd love to do that. And so they took me over <laughs> to their manager and their manager was a guy named Albert Grossman. And Albert Grossman was the manager for Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul and Mary, Odetta, the Queskin Jug Band, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. I mean, pretty much everybody important in the music business at that time. And so uh, I signed on and got $200 for the weekend and was into the inner circle of Grossman's world. and. So it just so happened that uh, Dylan decided on the spur of the moment on a Saturday afternoon that he would play rock and roll on Sunday. It was partially pushed by the fact that Alan Lomax had tried to unplug the Butterfield Blues Band from playing on Saturday afternoon. But anyway, it was, it was like a, uh, you know, middle finger lifted to the folk movement in a way, in the sense that Bob had already started playing rock and roll and he decided, well, why not play it here? But of course, as you can see, the folkies did not react well to that, <laughs> that gesture. Um, and they rebelled against it pretty strongly. And yet, it didn't change Bob's mind. He, he made it clear that he was gonna to continue to make this kind of electric music. His compromise was in the future was to play the first half of his concerts acoustic and the second half mm -hmm. electric. And he found himself a rock and roll band which was called Levon and the Hawks. Oh yeah. And they were playing in a a, a little club in the Jersey Shore. And we all know them now as the band, but they were just uh, a cover band. You know, the kind of band that would play mm -hmm. Bobby Blue Bland tunes or play Ray Charles tunes or do, do whatever. You know, they were a rhythm mm -hmm. and blues band, basically. And, you know, Robbie Robertson tells the story of, basically they got booed everywhere in the United States for a year. And then they went to Europe and they got booed everywhere in Europe for a year. <laughs> and then they went to Australia and they got booed everywhere in Australia. So the, the fans, the folk fans of Dylan were not a forgiving bunch. And they just felt like rock and roll was some kind of big sellout. And that's where that ended up. Wow. So, so you included it at the beginning of your book for a reason. What, what, so, raise the metaphor a little bit. What, what, what happened? Well, it was a crack in the known universe in the sense that I had been drawn into the music of Dylan through the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. In 1963, 
Bob had sang at the March on Washington. I had seen the scenes of in the spring of 63 of Bull Connor in Birmingham, Alabama, using fire hoses and dogs on 16 year old kids who were just trying to demonstrate against the racism mm -hmm. of Birmingham, Alabama. And it had, it had reached me in a really deep place. I, I felt angry, I felt hurt. And so I went out and joined a group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, mm -hmm. which was a very multiracial group under the leadership of John Lewis, who just died last year, and, and a guy named Bob Moses. Mm -hmm. We were both very church oriented people. And like Dr. King, it was it infused with the notion that love could conquer hate and that nonviolence was the whole core of that movement. And so when you would be involved in a sit in, mm -hmm. music was part of that. You would uh, sing Blowing in the Wind, or you would sing We Shall Overcome, or you should sing This Little Light of Mine, or, or those kind of things would help keep your courage up when people were yelling at you and, and calling you names. Mm -hmm. And so there was a kind of perfect marriage between the culture and the music. And Dylan's music was really a, an important part of it. I mean, the lines in the times they are changing about telling the parents to get out of the way of the children and let them do their thing. That reached me very deeply because I felt my parents were holding me back in a way, or at least my father was. Sure. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that Newport represented something different, which was Bob's kind of break from okay, I'm not going to sing protest songs anymore. I'm going to sing about more personal issues. Um, but that didn't mean it wasn't just as rebellious or wasn't just as revolutionary. It was just, it was just different. And it was probably a little more fun too, you know. Yeah, you, you've got an interesting piece in your book. Um, and I don't want to uh, draw it out too far, but um, I think in reference to uh, the rock and roll culture that was really starting to kick in around, uh, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll. Um, and you wrote, uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a political rebellion so much as a desire to act with a kind of autonomy that had been missing before. But the notion that pleasure was an answer to social discord, not merely a diversion from it, was a, a sort of collective hallucination. And I, I wonder in that um, movement of Dylan to the electrified sound, you know, which really became the sound for uh, the late 60s anyway, um, if it, uh, so as a baby boomer at the end, for me, I came to conscious, uh, rock and roll consciousness when the Sex Pistols came. And, 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 and rock and roll was angry, rock and roll was rebellion, um, don't mess with my autonomy, mom and dad, but it was also, uh, you know, the powers that be, the dominion, um, were, had us down like this, and we're, we're fighting back, mm -hmm. and, um, and we're going to make a glorious martyr of ourselves. You know, Neil Young says, you know, be, better to burn out than to fade away. Right. So I don't think Bob's music represented that. You know, Bob's music was not the, the angry stuff of the Sex Pistols. In, mm -hmm. in fact, you know, Just Like a Woman or Visions of Joanna or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, are really, they're really love songs, you know, yeah. Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, they're love songs. Mm -hmm. So, but I do think that something seminal happened in the late 60s which disconnected many of us from the political concerns that we had mm -hmm. lifted up in the early 60s. And that was 
that in the spring of 1968, our two greatest leaders, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were mm -hmm. killed. And they were both leaders who were coming out of a place of love, of reconciliation, mm -hmm. of trying to bring people together. And it was as if, well, hell with politics, because it'll only break your heart. Mm -hmm. And we, we raised these people up, whether it was John Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King, and then they get cut down by an assassin's bullet and there's no way to win in this game. And so screw it, I'll join the rock and roll circus. I'll go off in this mm -hmm. other life. And, but of course that's a false premise yeah. because you can't leave it behind. And, and what was the result? We got Richard Nixon as our president. So, I mean, that was a kind of youthful anger mm -hmm. that just let us, well, you, you can ignore politics. And of course, we constantly come back to that in the present era. You know, people mm -hmm. feel so cynical about politics and in general and think everyone is corrupt. And, and mm -hmm. so why should I vote? My vote won't make a difference. You know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of emotion comes out of that time. And, and that was, a. it also happened to be the time when it went from a kind of where at least the drugs part of sex, drugs and rock and roll, which was fairly benign in the sixties cause it was just smoking pot, you know, mm -hmm. turned into something darker which was the white powders of cocaine and heroin, which then really just messed with people's minds in a really deep way that made it very hard to hold groups together, made it very mm -hmm. hard to hold uh, a band together. And I saw it with the band that I was, you know, managing, mm -hmm. which was the band. And I saw, you know, Robbie and Garth kind of stay on the straight and narrow and trying to be working every day. And I saw Levon and Richard and, Rick kind of just go down a rabbit hole of consumption and craziness and alcohol and drugs. And it just, it blew everything apart, you know? And mm -hmm. never mind, you know, Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison or Janis Joplin or other people, some of whom were my friends. I mean, mm -hmm. Janis was, a, I wouldn't call her a close friend, but she was a close enough friend that we spent quite a few nights commiserating and about our own upbringing because we'd both been called nigger lovers and that, you know, where we grew up in high school. And, and she, she didn't mean to kill herself. I, I know that she was in a good place musically mm -hmm. and everything, but she just made a mistake. You know, when, when people try and quit drugs Mm -hmm. And then they come back on and they don't remember how much they used to take. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it just, it was just a classic, sad situation. Yeah. Yeah. And Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's a constant refrain in your, uh, in the book uh, uh, about um, how um, the music, the art, culture um, is um, during, at least during the 60s, was based in a hopeful kind of place. Um, and, and that what I hear you saying is that, that to a certain extent, some of that hope got lost. Um, and, um, and then, you know, you, in the book, you move us directly to, you know, the current st state right. of cynicism where, you know, your vote doesn't count and irony is the, is the, the, the humor of the day. And, and right. cause we're, we're all just broken and not going to be able to do anything. Well, I mean, if you think about those songs in the early sixties, the times they are a changing, mm -hmm. we shall overcome. I have a dream. I, you know, the, the change is blowing in the wind. This is this sense that change is here, it's coming, embrace it. But 
when I look at the culture and, mm -hmm. and look, music is not as important today as it was in the 60s. Let's be mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you if you think about the social movements of the day, I would say that LeBron James played much more of a role in Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter or getting kids to register to vote this last fall than Jay-Z did. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, the vanguard position in the culture had shifted from musicians to basketball players. Mm -hmm. But what's more disturbing for me is if I look at the dominant culture that everybody talks about, the water cooler culture of today, mm -hmm. it's, it's the dramas that are on cable TV. Mm. And, and when I look at the post 9-11 era, what, what do I see? I see the Sopranos, Mad Men, Breaking mm -hmm. Bad, Succession, Game of Thrones. And what unifies them all is they're what we call anti-hero dramas. In other words, the protagonist is a horrible person mm -hmm. who either kills people or sells meth or is a soulless ad man who has no morals whatsoever or chops people's head off or, or is some kind of media mogul who has no morals whatsoever. And they're navigating a completely corrupt world. And yet they try and survive and get power in that world. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me if you're telling people constantly that that's the way the world is, that that's going to sink into people's brains in some level, the belief that everything is corrupt and only the most corrupt, powerful people rise to the top. Only mm -hmm. Tony Soprano can, can dominate. Uh, you know, only, you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch can dominate mm -hmm. in this world. I mean, that's succession. And that to me is not a good message. And it leads people to think, in 2016, well, maybe we should get one of these corrupt MFs to, to run the country because maybe he'll know how you do it, you know? And that that is a sad kind of situation and is very different from the kind of hopeful culture that I mm -hmm. uh, grew up in. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, kind of attracted me was that um, uh, you seem to infer several times that art um, ought to be hopeful, ought to, ought to create cracks in which uh, the possibility of, of new creation and new life and new possibility can exist. Yeah, and, and look, I don't want to be a bring down, I actually believe mm -hmm. that art constantly reinvents itself. Mm -hmm. You know, remember that when Bob Dylan was singing in 1963, his first album sold only 4,000 copies. Mm -hmm. You know, Frankie Avalon and Fabian sold millions of copies in 1963. So mm -hmm. the popular music was this pop mm -hmm. fluff. And I, I guarantee nobody here on this webcast probably remembers a Frankie Avalon tune, you know, but the point is that Bob Dylan lasted. I mean, the very fact that he's still playing mm -hmm. live, <laughs> and if you had asked me in 1969, <laughs> would he still be on the road in 2021? I would say, you are crazy, <laughs> but here he is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, the music lasted, you know, it mm -hmm. had it had validity. And and so in that same way where there was very popular music, uh, then there was authentic music that was underground. I see that today. Mm -hmm. I see that uh, there's a movement called Americana, mm -hmm. which is a kind of roots music. Some of it's kind of country, some of it's rhythm and blues, some of it's even bluegrass. And, it, and it's young people making this really authentic American music. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's marvelous. 
it's it, you know Jason Isabel and Brandy mm -hmm. Carlisle and and these people and so I go down to this festival every year mm -hmm. in September in Nashville called Americana Fest mm -hmm. and it's just fills me with hope so mm -hmm. I don't I don't believe that we aren't going to get past this and then maybe mm -hmm. that nihilism and and kind of you know dystopian view of the world was connected into the politics which maybe are going away and maybe we're going to have a more benign view of of the world and maybe our art will start to reflect that yeah wouldn't it be interesting uh if biden's uh i don't know if biden said it but his his path to success is he's going to try to bore everyone so much yeah that <laughs> Right. That they, that with politics that they can pay attention to something else. <laughs> yeah. And, and maybe politics won't be the thing that mm -hmm. you spend all your time thinking about. Maybe you spend your time thinking about literature. Mm -hmm. Maybe you spend your time thinking about great music or yeah. or or your faith. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that since this is a church uh, format. Right. Um, let's talk about... Uh, it's woven throughout the book, and, and I know woven through your life, is a, mm -hmm. uh, a real spiritual path, um, and much of it uh, in reference to the uh, Episcopal way of, of moving through it. Um, talk about how your faith has uh, sort of informed you or guided you or supported you during um, the course of your many forks in the road. Well, you know, I... I, there's a passage in the book, which I, maybe I'll read, mm -hmm. which is, um, so I, I went to this boarding school and in the fall of 61, at the age of 14, I was sent away by my father to Brooks, a boarding school for boys in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. The headmaster in the tradition of English public schools like Eaton believed that every man needed grounding in the classics. And so not only did we study Latin and Greek as languages, but also became versed in the classical philosophies and playwrights. Thus it was that at the age of 14, I came upon the philosophy of Epicurus as a young man far away from my home in Cleveland, friendless and adrift, I took readily to Epicurus's view of what made a good life, which he broke into three elements. Hmm. One, the company of good friends, two, the freedom and autonomy to enjoy meaningful work, and three, an examined life built around a core faith. Mm. And so I didn't have any of those things at 14. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was so alone, I because it was an Episcopal boarding school, I ended up finding in the church some sense of solace, some sense of trying to find a place that I could stand. Mm -hmm. And then that led me to a, a preacher named William Sloan Coffin, who was the chaplain of Yale, who came to preach at the school and basically said, you know, we are in this crisis moment in which people of faith need to stand up for the rights of all Americans. Mm -hmm. And when his talk was over, I went with him to walk to his car and, and I felt like he had just talking right at me. And, and I said, you know, I've joined Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, but nobody here has any interest in any of these issues. What should I do? And he said, well, I didn't see any Negro students in the audience. Are there any? And I said, mm -hmm. no. And he said, well, and that was it. And so <laughs> I took it as my mission to try and get the school to integrate, which I eventually did, you know, and caused a huge amount of problems for the headmaster and didn't win me any friends anywhere. But the point was at that place, Bill Coffin set me on a path. Later on, I found faith came back to me and several times. I mean, you know, there's a sequence in the book where yeah. 
I had to, I was asked by George Harrison to, to produce the concert for Bangladesh. And George had chosen Eric Clapton to be the lead guitar player. And Eric Clapton was deeply addicted to heroin at this time. And so the task of just getting him on stage was a total scary battle that, you know, I didn't ever want to go through again. But I saw Eric two years later and he was totally straight. Mm -hmm. And he said that it was his faith that he, mm. he had bottomed out to such a level that he'd gotten down on his knees and said, I don't know what to do, but show me where to go, God. And God showed him where to go. And it wasn't a 12 step program. It wasn't anything. It was just pure communion. Mm. And then, and he's been straight ever since. In fact, he runs, he finances an addiction clinic called Crossroads for musicians. Mm. That's, that's an incredibly effective mm -hmm. uh, addiction clinic. So, I mean, faith comes to people in all sorts of strange ways. And, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it came, you know, Marty Scorsese went through the same thing. Totally addicted to cocaine. Completely, we went through the craziest period that I can ever imagine. Mm -hmm. But somehow he was hospitalized. And when he was in the hospital and, they, and the doctor told him, if you do that again, you're going to die. Somehow this kid who had wanted to be a priest mm -hmm. when he was 16 mm -hmm. came back to the church and it helped him get himself straight you know mm -hmm. so you know who knows how this stuff happens well you you suggested uh how it happens in in that difficult interlude you had when you found yourself back in cleveland heights yeah. um yeah you know, with your mother and it what it happens when there's a recognition of vulnerability it sounded like right i mean i my marriage had fallen apart i had completely felt like I'd let down my children. Uh, I, I, I was completely lost. And my mother said, well, come to church with me. Let's, let's just get down on our knees and ask for guidance. And from that day on, then I became a real churchgoer. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I was a, a on and off attendee Mm -hmm. before then but from that day on then i then i realized that i needed it ever, as often as i could get it to bring me back to god and those basic ideas you know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah you know i mean there's a just one other note on the notion of spirituality I think that some of the greatest music that's ever been made has been made from an incredible spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, we all know about Beethoven and, and, you know, of some of the great mm -hmm. choral music and, and Handel's Messiah and all that. But I talk about in the book about Aretha Franklin. Yeah. And Aretha Franklin had grown up in the church and her father was a pastor and had left the church and was making very secular music. And of course, in the black community, this, this notion of Saturday night and Sunday mm -hmm. morning is always a, a tension for blues singers. Mm -hmm. right? right. And so she had gone to Saturday night and forgotten about Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Jerry Wexler, who was a producer, said to her, I think you should record a gospel album. Mm -hmm. And so they, they got a church downtown, the AME church, mm -hmm. uh, and they got 
uh, Reverend James Cleveland's choir, which is the one of the greatest gospel choirs that existed. Mm -hmm. And they rehearsed for a week. And so Rita, she's a young woman at this point. She's 28. Mm -hmm. She's had nothing but hits. She had one hit after another. And she just immerses herself into this music. And then they, and as they're rehearsing, Jerry Wexler realizes this is, this is astonishing what's happening here. And so he goes to Warner Brothers because Atlantic Records, which was her label, was owned by Warner Brothers and mm -hmm. says, somebody has got to film this. This is going to be a sign. Mm -hmm. So Sidney Pollack was sitting around on the lot with nothing <laughs> to do. And they got Sidney to organize very quickly a, a crew to shoot it. And so he shot it. And it's called Amazing Grace. And for 25 years, that film sat in the can because Aretha would not let them put it out. And, and I tried to figure out why that was. And when you look at it, what you realize is that there are moments in that film where she is so vulnerable Mm. where she is so transported by the spirit and there's just sweat pouring off her and she's just like she's in the moment mm. there's a song called precious memories that it just was completely off code for the diva that she had projected what she was mm. she wasn't this vulnerable like transported in the spirit person she was just in control woman and she didn't like to see herself that vulnerable mm. and it was only after she died that her family said well this is amazing it should be seen and then now it's out and and i recommend it highly to anybody to see it because it's one of the most transporting hours mm. and a half of music you've ever seen in your life mm. wonderful wonderful so I am appearing as request <laughs> to let you all know that we've got about 15 minutes left. This has just been such a great conversation. I've been hiding behind the photo and listening to everything. And um, now though, um, we'd like you with your permission, we'll open up for questions. Um, so I already have someone got a question in the Q&A box and I'm reminding you the Q&A box is where you want to put your questions. Uh, we already have one, so if I may, I'm going to read that one. And this is from Diane Plaster, who is just a longtime member of this parish and uh, one of our wonderful staff soloists in the choir, beautiful musician. And, um, and she writes, we saw the last waltz again the other night. And she says, parentheses, my homework for today's session. <laughs> How did the film come about was it an idea of yours, Robertson's, or possibly Scorsese's? Okay. So the way it came about was that Robbie Robertson, who was the guitar player and kind of the leader of the band, had gone to the place where he was just tired of going on the road. And of course, the band was kind of falling apart. There were, there were, drug issues and everything. And so he said, let's, let's go out with a real bang, right? And so let's have this concert and we'll have it on Thanksgiving and we're gonna do it at Winterland where we started. And Bill Graham said, great, I'm in, I'll, pro I'll produce the concert. And Winterland is this big arena up in San Francisco, holds 7,000 people. And so then Robbie began to call around to his friends and he called Neil Young and then he called Van Morrison and then he called Muddy Waters and then he called Joni Mitchell. And slowly but surely we got this and then he called Bob Dylan and, and there was this incredible lineup of talent. And really it was Robbie that, that made all that happen. And then he came to me and he said, this is look at these all these 
great people we've got that are going to be on stage. We should film it. And I said, well, Marty Scorsese, who I had made a movie called Mean Streets with uh, two, two years before, Marty is going to be really mad if we let someone else do this. And But the problem is, of course, Marty was right in the middle of shooting a movie called New York, New York. Uh, with Liza Minnelli and Bob De Niro. So it was a big, big movie it was doing. But it just so happens that the Thanksgiving holiday <laughs> in Hollywood is a long holiday. They break at lunchtime on a Wednesday and you don't have to be back at work until the next Monday. So we had enough days for Marty to get up to San Francisco to organize all of the, the stuff the day before get and and marty got the best cinematographers in the world laszlo kovacs vilmo sigmund michael mm -hmm. chapman all these great photographers and we shot it on 35 millimeter film which was a big task right uh and so it came together really quickly uh the the shooting itself was filled with all sorts of ups and downs. So I, I can just tell one little story, which is that Marty had these given each of the cinematographers these headphones so he could talk to them and say, okay, I want you to move over and shoot the guitar player because there's a guitar solo coming in, or I want you to move over and do this wide shot, or I want you to. So, so we had it all choreographed with seven cameras. And this wonderful Czech named Laszlo Kovacs pretty soon got tired of hearing Marty yammering his ears and he took off his headphones and put them around his neck. And <laughs> so the problem with shooting on 35 millimeter film is that you run out of film every 10 minutes, right? The, the magazines are only 10 minutes long. So we had to figure out that every three, two songs, you'd have to take a break and not film the third song. And so Marty going through all that had, had seen that Muddy Waters was going to do two songs. One was called Caledonia and the other was called Manish Boy. And so Marty said, okay, we'll shoot Caledonia and during Manish Boy, we'll shut down and, and we won't shoot that one. So we get to Manish Boy, he tells everybody to shut down their cameras. And then the first chords, bum, 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 bum. And it's of course, I'm a man, right? It's oh. the most famous Muddy Waters song. Only Marty didn't understand that Manish Boy was the title for I'm a man. And he's going, oh my God, I've totally blown it. Except the Laszlo <laughs> Kovacs is still <laughs> filming, right? And so if you see the film, the whole song is done from one camera angle because the guy didn't listen to the direction. <laughs> and it's so perfect. Literally two seconds before he ran out of film, the big wide shot comes back on and you're able to get it. And, and so we captured it. It was, it was a wonderful, uh, lucky moment. No kidding. Yeah. I have one other story about that since I don't see there are any other questions. Yeah, go for it. Um, and, and this is probably a little, not sleazy, but this is not necessarily church stuff, but, but I think people will be amused because <laughs> Bruce had said sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> so we cut the film together and we cut it on a little editing bench called a chem, which has a screen about the size of a small laptop. So it's 35 millimeter film, but you know, it's a very tiny screen. So then we say, well, let's have a screening of the film for the first time we ever throw it up big. We have a screening and we invite all the musicians and all their managers. And so we're screening it and the, the film was flowing and we get to Neil Young's song called Helpless. And he starts singing, yeah, a very famous song, right? And about a minute into the song, this huge 
rock of cocaine starts to come out of his nose <laughs> down onto his mustache. And the more he shakes his head, the lower the rock of cocaine comes. And everybody in the office is laughing. And <laughs> it's just not the effect you wanted. So when the film was over, his manager comes up to me and says, well, you got to take Neil out of the film. I'm not going to have that. And mm. I said, well, give me a couple of days, see if I could figure out what to do about this. So I went down to Hollywood to a place called Pacific Title. And there, this 67 year old guy who'd seen it all. And I, I, we put it on the movie roll. And I said, this musician, he had no idea who Neil Young was. I said, this guy has got a booger in his nose and we got to get rid of it. And he, <laughs> they put it on and he had this <laughs> magnifying glass on his movie roll. And he said, whoa, that's a beaut. He said, <laughs> So he said, so he said, come back in a couple of days. I'll tell you. I came back a couple of days. He said, well, I've invented this thing called the traveling booger mat. And we're going to take this little black dot and we're going to rephotograph every single frame of the movie and just move the black dot over the booger. And for $10,000, we were able to eliminate. <laughs> That's oh. pretty cool. <laughs> so I see there are two more questions. Yeah, let me give them to you. So the first one comes from Pete Mann, a longtime member of the parish and a musician. And uh, he would like to know what's your most memorable moment from the festival, ex best rival or festival express? Um, is that a typo or is the, that? Yeah, no, no, that's the most memorable. So the festival express was a, a, a music festival all across Canada. It started in Montreal, went to Toronto, Ontario, Winnipeg, Calgary, and Vancouver. And the, the cool thing of it was that there was a private railroad train that had been rented from the Canadian National Railroad that would take us from town to town. And in the railroad train, there was a very big bar car, meaning <laughs> a place with a bar and lots of couches and, you know, just lounge. It was a lounge. And all the musicians had their own sleeping quarters and there was a dining car, but this bar car became the place where everybody met. And so there's a very long way between Winnipeg and Calgary mm -hmm. and Janis Joplin and Rick Danko and Jerry Garcia were leading the task i mean i don't know if you can see this picture mm -hmm. but this is all of them in the train and at some point the grateful dead ran out of pot and so janice suggested <laughs> that they try her drink of choice which is called southern comfort it's a really <laughs> awful kind of sweet liquor kind of drink but I guess it does the trick. I never could stand it. Anyway, so they start <laughs> drinking up to Southern Comfort and, and pretty soon Janice realizes that they've drunk in all of her Southern Comfort and she <laughs> is pissed off. And she says, we have to stop this train and resupply. <laughs> and we're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so I go to the conductor and he says, well, there's a tiny little Indian reservation about 50 miles up. And they probably have a liquor store. <laughs> and so we get there and we take up a collection from all the musicians, got $500. And myself and Janice's road manager, we go in and sure enough, there's a liquor <laughs> store there. And sure enough, they had Southern Comfort and they had Jack <laughs> Daniels, the two mandatory <laughs> liquors. And we put the $500 down on the table and we said, Tell us when we spent it all. And uh, <laughs> we came back to the train and we were heroes. And <laughs> Janice proceeded to drink them all under the table. She was the last person standing oh. that night. They all <laughs> passed out. <laughs> oh. Great story. You know, lot, lots of miles through nowhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Need to find a way to make it more interesting. All right, so we have another question. This is from Adora Earl. <clears throat> what do you think was the thing that made it possible for you to integrate your school despite all the opposition you faced? Uh, 
Well, the headmaster of the school was an Episcopalian lay minister. Um, and I think he understood that the challenge that William Sloan Coffin had laid down uh -huh. was the right thing. Mm -hmm. His problem was that a lot of the alumni sent their children to an all white boarding school for the very reason that they didn't want an integrated school. Yeah. So he had to confront the fact that he would lose funding and that was his pushback. But he eventually realized it was the right thing to do. And in fact, when I graduated, he gave me the prize named for his brother, the Alan Ashburn Prize, basically saying, you know, I caused a lot of trouble, but he respected everything I had to say and he was glad I did it, you know? So, I mean, mm. he, he somehow, you know, I think he probably preyed on it a lot and came to the, conclusion that of course they had to do that so when you just said caused a lot of trouble now i'm having a brain moment where my brain's not working what is that phrase that's in the black church about trouble going out john, making john trouble making big trouble is it just making big trouble i thought there was a different adjective and maybe uh, yeah uh, i i, I darn don't know it. i'm so, that's yeah. so frustrating but it's, it's yeah. like you make the right trouble you make the exactly good, good trouble. trouble good there trouble. trouble there it is that's is stephanie good? that's because she's, yes. she's got a much younger brain <laughs> yeah. <laughs> making good trouble okay yeah. I'm seeing that we have a, yeah and there's adora adora says good trouble all right sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm looking at 1.30 and I'm not seeing any other questions okay. in the Q&A box. This uh, was brilliant, Bruce. Yeah. Really, you're a very good interlocutor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the content was really the... Maybe you know, I, I have a thought to finish um, thought? with the words from, from Mahler um, that you put in the book. Could yeah. you context that? John, it's on page 300. Okay. So as all of you know, last year, there was a horrible fire that came up the canyon. I live up on, you know, Charmel Lane, so up, up above the parish. But it came up the canyon and it literally was coming for our house. It was not more than 20 yards away. And all our trees were singed and everything. And, and the fireman uh, said, get out of here. We had we saved all our photography. We were getting out of the house and the fireman said, don't worry, sir, I'll save your house. And the fireman stayed for, for three days. And mm. so, uh, let me just read this passage. In late October 19, 2019, a brutal wildfire warred up the canyon below our home in Pacific Palisades, California. As we evacuated our home while firemen pulled houses up our driveway, the flames were 20 year, yards from our porch. For three days, we lived in fear as the firefighters who were camped out in our backyard fought to extinguish the blaze. I fed them coffee and toast every day at 6 a.m. On the fourth day, as the trucks were leaving, having saved our house, I surveyed the burnt remains of the land below and remembered that I had tickets that night to the Los Angeles Philharmonic performance of Mahler's Second Symphony, Resurrection. I decided to go. At the beginning of the fifth moment, the 100 voice choir begins a passage that is so soft and so tender, it is on the very edge of audibility. And the voices began to swell. I felt a tear on my cheek. I didn't really expect it, but this amazing feeling of both sadness and relief flooded over me. I looked up at the super titles projected above the choir. Rise again. Yes, rise again. Will you, my dust, after a brief rest, immortal life, immortal life. Will he who called you give you to bloom again where you sown. The whole week of near tragedy and extraordinary blessing made sense through Mahler's transcendent music. That is what art can do if you let it. 
Mahler was wrestling lyrically in German with the great religious themes of death and resurrection. And yet I understood it through the music first, not the words. Uh. Here, here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, just wonderful. Christine. Okay, well, thank you. All I thank you, everybody. Is, thank you. Thank you for being here, Bruce. Thank you for, for um, keeping the conversation. And, and, and the, the book is on sale at Diesel, too, if you were, don't want to buy it online. If you want to support them, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. I remind yeah. you that um, the uh, link is in the chat box, so if you do want to do the online option. Okay. So yeah, Jen it's also available on Amazon if that's how you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> if you need it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone. All right. Yeah, thank Means you. a lot. All right. Okay. Thanks, Christine. Bye. Bye, Bye all. Bye.